Maybe you can confirm that you can uh, see. Yeah, we can see your screen, Sabuhi. And also, oh, by good. the way, this session is being recorded. So we're also going to be post, uh, posting this on YouTube at the end. So just for people who missed this event and want to know more about it later on. Fantastic. Whenever you're ready, Sabuhi, uh, we can begin. Uh, sure. I will not make a full screen. Maybe in this way, it's also fine. Um, do I want to minimize this? No, it can stay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Daniel and the BIH team. It's very good to be back because, uh, yeah, I have been part of Pilkin International House as an active member, as a board member. It's a very big portion of my experience uh, at Pilkent University. To start with, yeah, my name is Sabuhi Osmanos, uh, originally from Azerbaijan. Uh, I have lived in Pakistan and with Noshirwan we have been classmates. That's a very interesting part for those who didn't know this. So I have known Noshirwan since 2005, so almost 16 years. And uh, it was very good to study at Bilkent together as well. I, I was surprised when he messaged me like, hi Sabuhi, um, are you at Bilkent? I'm like, yes. He's like, I'm also coming to, to study at Bilkent. I'm like, great, good to see you after like several years. <laughs> So, and then after I finished my high school, uh, not in Pakistan, um, I decided to do my bachelor in Turkey in Ankara at Bilkent University. So I went there in August, 2014. After four years, I graduated and I decided to do my master's directly after my bachelor's. So I did the MS economics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands uh, for one year. Uh, almost all the master programs in the Netherlands are mostly for one year, some of them for two years. Um, yeah, and during my um, bachelor at Pitkent, I was a board member of BIH for three years. Um, yeah, moving on. So I want to just discuss shortly what could be the reasons to pursue or not to pursue about master's edu education, because of course it's up to people uh, whether they want to further continue studying uh, sooner or later. So decision, decision is important because, uh, yeah, you want to know if you want to do a master's or not. In case you say, yes, I want to do a master's, then you could do it right after your bachelor's. I did it that way. Many of my friends whom I know have done it that way. Uh, some of, yeah, some people try to also gain work experience for some time, maybe for one year or five years, doesn't matter. And then they go to uh, to master's. In my master program at Tilburg University, we had people who were like, yeah, 30 years old, who had done like, uh, who had three or five years of work experience, and then they came for masters. Um, people can take a gap year for traveling or fulfilling uh, some other duties, or for several reasons, they, they might just take a gap year or two, two years and not study and not do anything. Well, they could do volunteering experience or there could be other possibilities. So it's up to you whether you want to do a master's program or not. And then of course, where to do it. Uh, there are some requirements and personal recommendations by me. So of course, relevance of my bachelor's program is important because if you have studied uh, international relations and then you want to do another master's in a, separate, in a separate field, like, I don't know, engineering, data science, it's possible but maybe not all universities will accept you because your bachelor is different. Uh, Tilburg University offers a pre-master program as well. I actually have a friend uh, from Birkent and now he's currently studying at Tilburg University, Rustam. He did international relations at Birkent and then he came for data science. He did first pre-master program and then he was admitted to the master program itself. I did BA economics, so I was directly admitted to the master's program of MSc economics. Uh, GPA grades in general are important. That's one of the criteria universities always look at, but it's not really the only matter, like, yeah, it's not the only case that matters. So your GPA out of four, let's say, could be 3.1 or 3.9, and you could get to the master's program in any ways. So, and then when you start the master's program with a person who has done 3.1 and then 3.9, you start, well, at the same level in master's again. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to make your, to have your GPA higher, but I'm also trying to say like, um, yeah, you need to find some kind of balance and depends on how you divide your time. 
Recommendation letters are important. Most universities require it. I believe for Tilburg University, you, I had to get two recommendation letters. And I applied in January 2018. So deadline was 1st of April. Uh, and I already started talking to professors in October or November. So I could, well, I, I already had in mind from whom I want to take a recommendation letter in December or January, because that's usually required while doing the submission or like while doing the application. Soft skills and being an added value for the university. This is always something for your future university. And in your motivation letter to the university, in your application, you all you always have to write why do you want to choose that university. You need to include, um, you need to mention and also prove it why you will be an added value because of your international background, because you're a very brilliant student, or uh, you have been heading a student club, or you have been collaborating in group projects you have great leadership skills, you need to mention this in your motivational letter. Uh, soft skills also include uh, yeah, communication skills because I know many students from Bill Kent, they only spend time with 10, 10 friends in four years. So they don't really have communication letters when they want to meet a new person. But then if you have many people, if you know many people and you have talked to many people, whether international or from your own nationality, doesn't matter, or even to the security guy or yeah, you need to have this communication uh, skills. Uh, I'm not talk, I'm not going to mention other soft skills, but there are many. Extracurricular experience is very important. Of course, if you are if your GPA is four out of four, if you study very well, you're an amazing student, but you have no ex extracurricular experience, uh, then a person with a slightly lower GPA but with an extracurricular experience might be in a position above you. That's the that's the case from the real world that's i mean that's my opinion but uh, i can prove this as well and also personal contacts are important because if you already know who yeah, yeah a person who has studied in your future university or you can talk to professors and maybe they know someone who is teaching at the university it's already something yeah it's already a plus for you i also have a friend i'm not going to mention his name but uh, yeah he got into it into a PhD program simply because uh, he found a person with whom yeah it was possible to work with under like for the PhD program so personal contacts are very important as well uh, moving on researching an application I will also try to keep it short knowing we have a time limit uh, yeah making an overview I use an Excel file for example is very important I already had this at the end of my third year, so starting from September of my fourth year in Bilkent, I already had an overview of Excel file, like which university I want to apply for, in which countries, whether they offer scholarships, what exams are uh, required. Uh, yeah, just a general list. Of course, it's up to you what you include in your overview, but then it's also kind of nice to keep the track. Like you have applied to this or deadline is this, so you need to apply before this date. Before applying, as I mentioned, you need to talk to your professors for guidance and also with your just colleague, friends uh, for tips and tricks. At Bilkent, there's a group, Bilkent Do Yuru. From there, I have seen many people asking for tips before they go to Erasmus or before go to they go to master's program. So they can already have some knowledge. Talking to professors is very good for guidance as well because, uh, for example, I was admitted to a few universities and I talked to four different professors at Bilkent University. All four of them suggested Tilburg University. And I was like, okay, this is my decision. That's how I decided. And of course, willingness to live in the country you will be studying to. You will be going like the, university, the country you will be living in where you will study. It's very important because you don't want to just study for one or two years master. You want to love the country you will be living in because you will be studying and living, that, living there. Uh, Netherlands, I had heard only positive things about the Netherlands, so I was more than happy to come here to study. I'm still very happy to live here. Uh, about general university information for the Dutch universities, I will quickly skim this. Um, yeah, the general procedure, most universities do it from their own website. Some of them have application fee. Tilburg University does not have any, so you can just submit. In For the Dutch universities, I believe all of them are linked to this study link uh, platform, but it's very easy. As, yeah, when you check from the website, it's very easy, straightforward. 
uh, some universities have a single campus like Tilburg University, University of Twente, uh, or they can be spread within the city, throughout the city, like Amsterdam University, Leiden University. So vacant University is like a single campus, so Tilburg is in such way also similar. Accommodation of options, universities send you guidelines where you can look for or what you can search for, but it's totally up to you where you want to reside in. Uh, so you need, as soon as you have acceptance, I would recommend starting your search because uh, I know people who couldn't find their room or accommodation for yeah two months in a row. Um, usual conditional acceptance, of course, and once you receive your diploma, it's unconditional. Receiving of a response can vary from two weeks to two months. Tilburg University usually replies in two, three weeks. This is my experience, this is the experience of my friends. So you can try and check it yourself. One thing most people don't know before coming, before applying to Tilburg University is if you're a built-in university graduate, you automatically receive 25% reduction in your tuition fee. So I did not pay as a non-EU citizen, I did not pay around 15,000 euros for one year. I paid around 11,000 euros and that's because I'm a built-in university graduate and they offered me 25% reduction. And also, you can also pay this instead of one go, you can divide this amount into eight and pay, yeah, in eight months in a row, we have around 1500 every month. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, in my one year program, we had two semesters. Uh, so first semester was from September till December and the second semester from January till uh, you graduate. Uh, first semester is usually divided into two blocks. The first block is September, October, and I had three courses, four courses in my first block. And then uh, the second block is from mid-October till end, end, end December. So technically in my first semester, I had seven courses, uh, three of them in the first block, three of them in the second block, and one course within the first semester in total. And the second semester, has block three, which is from January till yeah March or early April, usually three courses. So for three blocks, I had 10 courses. I also took additional Dutch course, just to speak basic Dutch. And then from April onwards, it's your thesis period. You start writing your thesis. And since the academic year finishes in August, you can yeah finish your thesis in June and graduate, or you can extend it till the end of August or if you have the chance and motivation and of course money, you can also extend it a bit longer and finish and graduate a bit long, a bit later. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, your day, your, your weekly schedule. So in my third block, I was free on Fridays, for example. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't really passed the limit. Um, yeah, and I will stop sharing my screen now then, and I will, give the floor back to Daniel. Thank you so much, Sabuhi. Uh, that was really enlightening. And I, I did not know about like the 20% automatic fee reduction you get in Tilburg. Like that is something that automatically like shot out at. <laughs> and See also, you next year at Tilburg. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh, also like, by the way, for most people who do not know, uh, Sabuhi, I forgot to mention this, Sabuhi is a very resourceful guy. So it's a good thing if you get to know him, maybe follow him on LinkedIn or something like, you go out in Bill Kent, even to this day, literally almost everybody knows who Sabuhi Usmano was or is. Uh, he speaks a lot of languages. He's lived in a lot of different countries. But speaking of uh, variety and diversity, the next speaker we have with us is Nasherwan Aziz. He comes from Pakistan. Uh, he was like a brother to me. He's still like a brother to me. Uh, another ex-president. Uh, he's currently studying in the UK. Very charismatic. Nosh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen do what you want. Yeah, when you said was for a second, I got worried, you know, am I still alive as the work goes <laughs> what, what happened? You're you in know? the UK um, now, man, what can I do? Like, we can't hang out every weekend anymore. Yeah, that, that unfortunately is true. Okay, I'm just gonna set this up. Can you guys see the screen? Daniel, Sabuhi, if you confirm. Great, fantastic. Right, guys, um, I'm just gonna try and see if I can make this full screen. Work. Yeah, it is great. 
Okay, guys, so I'm going to be giving a guide to the master's process similar to Sabuhi as well. Um, as Daniel introduced me, I'm Nash. I'm doing my MSc in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Edinburgh Business School. So I'm currently in Edinburgh in Scotland in the process of finishing this up. And yeah, it's a one-year program for me as well. So for the agenda, basically, I'm going to um, talk about how to decide on masters, how to choose a university, the application process, what to focus on, then the conclusion. So for the decision, the first question is, do you have a specific program or area? So I know a lot of us in undergrad applied to a different kinds of like programs. Some of us applied to like management, economics, these kinds of things at the same uni. That was fine for undergrad, brilliant, it's great, but at um, at masters, you need to be specific. So you need to know at the very minimum, at least the area of the field. So if you're doing marketing, you could do marketing, advertising, sales, that kind of thing, but you shouldn't be doing like marketing and finance or marketing and management. No, if that's where your mind is at, then you're probably not in the right zone to do a masters and you need to figure this out first. The second question is, can you afford it? And can you find sufficient funding? You need to look up the cost for masters, the living costs, uh, whether you can afford it on your own or whether you can find sufficient funding. This is a very important question. Um, the third question, which I think it's something that, again, is really important. Do you have the capacity to study for one or two years? If you're feeling awfully burnt out at the end of your undergrad and it's just a struggle to even finish, and trust me, I know Bilkin can really make things a struggle in that sense, but if you feel like it's going to be difficult to just... Um, figure things out in that sense, you know, in terms of would you be able to get moving, get that dedication because masters is quite intense. So you need that energy. So you need to ask yourself that. And the last thing that you need to ask yourself is the career prospects after masters. Look at whether the master's program you're doing is gonna help you. What are your career plans? Do you wanna go back to your home country? Do you wanna stay in Turkey, but do your master's somewhere else? What do you want to do? You need to ask yourself this and um, all these questions will inform your decision. Choosing a university, this is not um, in order. This is just the five points I think cover up everything. Uh, you need to look at the rankings because the rankings usually inform how prestigious your university is, um, how employers look at it. Um, you should look at both the overall and your field ranking in my opinion, um, because of course your field ranking is extremely important, but also the overall ranking sometimes matters a lot in your, uh, in your own, like in the sense of, you know, just, the prestige, the overall respect employers have. The second thing is location. Um, so unlike what Sabui said about Netherlands, in the UK, location matters quite a lot. There's a huge difference whether you go to London in terms of uh, like expense, in terms of just this big city with things going on. There's a huge difference in, if you're in Edinburgh or in the North or in Wales or Northern Ireland. So you need to look at the location, look at what the housing looks like, look at the culture, even look at like the crime rate and all, whatever is important for you, but do consider the location as well. Edinburgh is a beautiful city. So I think I chose things quite smartly when it came down to location and location was one of my key factors towards making my final decision. And I'll come to that uh, later and explain that scenario. By exit, what do I mean by exit? Exit means your job prospects in the country. So let's say if you wanna study in the UK, you need to look at, okay, what's the job market like in the UK, which it's recovering, of course, COVID hit things quite badly, but it is in the process of recovery. Um, and you also need to look at your visa. So what happens after your student visa? Can you stay in the country you want to study in? Um, some countries don't let you stay, unfortunately. Some let you stay one year, some let you stay two years. So you need to look at that and see whether you have enough time to actually move to that country if that's your priority. Then the program. The program, again, as I mentioned before, you need to know what you want to study. But apart from that, it's not just knowing the program generally, you need to look at the course load. Uh, marketing might be taught very differently in one place. Entrepreneurship and innovation, even though it's quite a specific field, it might be taught in two different ways. It was actually, um, I was considering Manchester and Edinburgh before I decided to come to Scotland. And Manchester's program outlook and Edinburgh's is significantly different for something even that's very niche like entrepreneurship and innovation. So make sure you look at that course outlook, the workload, who's teaching even, just get a feel of the program, see that you're comfortable with it. And the last thing is funding sources, which of course are very important. I'm gonna talk about this in, um, in a second. 
Okay, so the application process. You should have your CV ready when you're applying. Um, this is vitally important. You just have your CV, your extracurriculars, your information about Bill Kent, what courses you took, designed, looking great, just have that ready. Personal statement. In the UK, it's usually one page, but again, look it up for the universities you're applying, the countries you are. Some might have two pages, some might have a thousand words. Some have questions that you need to answer and the personal statement is split that way. Um, but make sure you cover uh, everything that's needed. And what usually in, for the UK, what you need to do is you need to link things to your program and give your career plan for what happens afterwards. So for example, if, if you're like, let's say you're like Danielle and you're like the president of BIH right, right now and you're applying, that's fantastic. But in the personal statement, he needs to show how that has given him skills relevant to the program. And that is vitally important. Uh, so you need to talk about your ambitions, your goals, that kind of thing, but everything is related to the program. Constant contact with advisor, mentor, outside sources. Um, again, get in touch with your faculty advisor. If you don't, sort of, you're not on the same page with your faculty advisor, they need something else, find another professor. Find people, find people within your family. If there's someone who's done masters or someone in your field, find contacts. It is very important to have a pool of advice, but keep this pool limited. So don't take advice from anyone and everyone because that can just confuse you, but think of who to talk to, get that pool and then talk to them. Recommendation letter, again, um, extremely important. Uh, in the UK, it's usually one. Some universities need two, but have two lined up. Definitely, at the minimum, have two faculty members lined up because you don't want to last minute see, oh, this university needs two, and you're running around because professors aren't really um, that happy if you go to them last minute. It's better to have this um, lined up before the deadline. And the last thing is visas and deadline. So depending on the country you're applying to, look at the visa processes, see how long it takes, what documents are needed. Sometimes you might get surprised. Um, like the UK, generally, it has a tough, but time-wise efficient visa process. So things usually go quickly in terms of processing, but um, some countries like Ireland take months to process it, you know? And um, this is just something to keep in mind so you don't want surprises. And deadlines, deadlines are important because, um, well, you need to meet the deadlines, but also some universities run rounds, some have rolling, some for, for some funding exhausts earlier. So this is really um, important. The application process, well, there Broadly speaking, four sources of funding. There's government scholarships, which usually have some kind of commitment to go back to your home country. There's university scholarships offered directly by the university. Um, there's foundation scholarships which are offered by some companies and all for certain programs. So look at these three uh, sources. And the last one is loans. So I'm actually taking a loan myself. I'm gonna drop the link at the end of my talk uh, for the website. We can talk about the loan in more detail. Of course, it's not like a scholarship. You have to pay it back. In my case, it's a private company, so there is interest involved. Um, I would recommend when you've chosen the loan plan, if you're going down this route, obviously try scholarships first, but if you're taking a loan, just make sure your family is on board, just in case you don't find a job or anything because you have to pay the loan back and it affects your credit score and stuff. So just make sure that you break it down to an amount that even if you don't find a job for a month or two, it's not something that your family would struggle to pay for you in the worst case, because it's important to think about the worst case. Undergrad focus points, three things. GPA, as we mentioned, there's no way around it. The GPA is important. But having said that, Bill Kent gives you a significant advantage in the UK, because for Turkey, UK has a range of GPA. So Edinburgh had 2.83. Now, what does that range mean? That range means that's the consideration range. So if you're below that, you're not gonna get considered. If you're in that zone, you will be considered. You may or may not get in slightly above that three zone and you will probably get in. But for Bill Kent, they said that the better your school, the lower like the GPA might go. So you'd be, you could even be closer to 2.8 uh, at Bill Kent and get in. But this was for management. Again, look it up for your specific um, programs and like specific faculties. But uh, yeah, so two extracurricular options. Again, you see the main thing for extracurriculars is to make your CV look good. So to, in order to do that, you just need to get two options in my opinion and do them in depth. So being a member of six societies, yeah, it has its worth for your personal development. Definitely I was a member of a lot, worked for a lot, 
but having two in-depth ones where you're like a board member or you're really engaging so you can talk about them, I think that's sufficient when it comes to applying for masters. So just focus on developing two expectations. And the last one is what I talked about previously, close contact with advisors and faculty. Get in touch with your faculty advisor, get in touch with faculty who teaches the subject you want to study in masters, take their opinion. It's worth its weight in gold, honestly. I would not have been here without the support of uh, my advisor. Um, and you know she helped me a lot. She wrote my recommendation letter, guided me throughout. So it's great. And the conclusion. Now, wherever possible, apply as soon as you can. Um, vitally important just to apply as early as possible. Funding expires, slots go away. So unless you're strategically waiting to apply later, maybe if you're trying to improve your GPA and you want the grades for a semester to come out, that's okay. But otherwise apply as early as possible. Um, have a private ranking of options. So please, this is vitally important, have your ranking of options written down. Because what happened for me was that Manchester applied earlier than expected, replied, sorry. And they told me I have a certain number of days to respond. And I got an extension, but even then Edinburgh was not supposed to respond because their deadline to respond was later. So I just sent a Hail Mary email to our program director at my MSc in Edinburgh. And he, I don't know if this is a coincidence or it was supposed to happen, but the same day I got my admission offer. But had I not gotten it, um, I would have then gone to Manchester because I didn't want to miss out on that. But that I could only make those decisions because I had the university's rank. And discuss and think through the decision, guys. This is a huge decision to do your master's. It is tiring. It takes a lot of energy. And it's your last major qualification, probably before you work. I mean, there are some people who do a second master's or a PhD. That's separate. But if you're thinking of directly working after this, this is your last major qualification. This is the university that's going to be your main sort of stamp on your profile, so to speak. And it's also um, going to be the last degree you do. So think this through. And um, yeah, that would conclude things for me. And yeah, thank you guys for listening. And yeah, I will uh, take your questions now. And one last thing before I finish, um, guys, I failed Calc three times. So I took Calc 106 four times. My GPA was, I think, 2.9 at the end of third year. I had 14 courses left, still made it. So if any of you guys are struggling, or you're not feeling confident, trust me, you're in a better situation than you believe and you truly can make it. So seriously, don't give up. It's fine. I have seen Nosh fail Calc three times and yeah, I have seen him pull through it. And now we were just talking about it the other day that Nosh was like, I really cannot believe that I'm actually giving a master's talk after failing Calc for three times. So guys, everyone, if you're failing your courses, you're good. But still, yeah, if you can uh, avoid failing, that's also fine. Yeah, yeah. Avoid failing is the best, but I'm just saying you if if there's a mathematical chance for you to graduate and all, you can do it. You trust Gosh, me. Please you. don't talk about mathematics and mathematical chances. It doesn't look good coming from you, man. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. All right, thank you so much, Nosh. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, uh, please send them. You can raise your hand and speak yourself. You can send them to the chat as well. Uh, we actually do already have one question. But, uh, uh, before we start the questions, I wanted to add one more thing because I, I saw from the uh, from Nashman's presentation, great presentation by the way. Uh, okay. If you study in the Netherlands, if you, uh, I'm not sure. I guess it's also applicable for bachelor. But let's say uh, for master, uh, you study in the Netherlands. Doesn't matter which university. Upon your graduation, uh, if you are a non-EU citizen, you you get the chance to live and search for jobs for one extra year. It's called orientation year visa. Uh, so simply, what like before your student visa expires, you can apply for the orientation year visa and uh, yeah, stay in the Netherlands for one extra year. If you find an internship or a job, you can already start working. If you don't, you can still live for one extra year. Uh, and one more information, maybe it's it can be relevant for some people. If you have graduated, yeah, this is mostly for Big University students, but. If you have graduated from top 200 universities in the world or your subject is in the top 200 in the world, you can still apply to the orientation year visa and come, and, and come to the Netherlands for one extra year. Uh, you need to do this three years after your graduation, within the three years after your graduation. Yes. Uh, is Bilkent University in the top 200? Bilkent University, 
I believe it's not in the top. It used to be, I think, at one point. I don't know. When I was coming, I, like, I didn't remember Blitz being know. highly ranked. You might be able to check by per subject. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you, Subway. Okay. First, uh, we have a question in the chat, but first, Sima had raised her hand. So, Sima, please wait. Uh, please unmute yourself. Oh, okay. I could. Uh, the question is it goes to both of you. You applied to, if you applied to multiple uh, programs, did you ever get rejections? Because I am like, I, this is my graduation semester and I applied for three programs and I already got two rejections and I'm not coping very well with it. So I will. I wanted to ask if it's a similar thing happened to you. How did you cope with it? Does it ever get better? Um, did you apply to three programs in the same university or three different universities? Three different universities. Um, yeah, I will give a short answer and maybe not sure one can add. Um, I also applied, I believe I, ex I had acceptance from four, maybe five universities. And I also got rejections, of course, um, especially there's an Erasmus Mundus program, amazing program that in two years you can study in two or three different countries and universities. I got rejected from both programs, I, I, but it was my dream. Uh, however, yeah, it, 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 really, it really depends. So the question is, how do you actually cope with it? Because you feel very bad when you get the rejection because when you apply to places, you kind of make up your mind. Like, you, I want I want to study here. Therefore, I'm applying for that place. Like, you look for places for rent. If I get accepted, how it's going to go? Then you wake up to, we don't have enough funding. Sorry. So how do you even cope with it was the question. But anyway. My personal answer and also the like addition uh, would be that I was also considering if I don't get any like, acceptance from any universities, my... Oh, I wouldn't say I was definitely going to be accepted to Bilkent University or even me, me too, uh, like or any other university in Turkey. But I, I was trying to have a backup, like if some things don't go wrong, if some things go wrong, like whether I got I don't get a visa or anything, then as a last option, I, I might try to just go with Bilkent or like Middle, Middle East Technical Universities or just give a back year or continue like, yeah. This is my, uh, I would just add that, look, um, it's, it's a tough process. Um, I applied to a very limited number of unis, so um, I didn't. I, I got rejected from my first choice program for one unexpectedly, and I was the first one that came through, and they just gave me to a very sort of B-grade program that I was not interested in doing at all. And with the student visa, I had some bad experience in the past. I was super stressed throughout the process, right? So uh, what I would recommend, like Sibui said, is just to have a backup and look, Keep this your spirit up. Look for other unis, see other options. Maybe even work a year and go for it. You know, because it's not like um, it's not something you have to do after undergrad. I know there's when you make up your mind, you really want to, but it's really not. There are lots of people in my program who work for a year, two years, that kind of thing. So just keep your spirits up. That's the most important thing. All right. Uh, Thank you. Through. Uh, we have uh, Edda Baisal is raising her hand, but before that, let me just look at the chat. Uh, Jamal said, I didn't catch the thing about the top 200 universities. What about them? They were just discussing if Bill Kent was a part of the top 200 universities. So we, you can also elaborate on it if you want. Uh, um, yeah, just in one sentence. If you, yeah, if you have done your bachelor uh, in a university, which is in the top 200 in the world, and I believe they... Yeah, you can check from the website directly. I believe they consider QS ranking, Shanghai ranking, and uh, top world universities. So, uh, yeah, there are two or three websites. And if your bachelor university is in the top 200, then you can come to the Netherlands uh, yeah, to for one extra year. But yeah, I believe this is applicable only for masters if you're coming from abroad. So I had friends who did their masters in the UK and they were able to come to the Netherlands for one year because their university in the UK was in the top 200 in the world. Okay. Oh, oh, according to Akshin Usmanov, it's actually Belkin is in the top 500 with five other universities in Turkey. Uh, the next, uh, we had a question by uh, Kubilay Pashale. Uh, he said, I have a question. Uh, I have attention deficiency and hyperactivity disorder that prevented me to do my work with motivation and failed many times. Failures in transcript would be affecting, even if you get others, would, would there be a question mark in their mind? Basically, he's having problems and that's why he has a lot of like failures because of these problems. So will this thing in his transcript affect 
or you know just uh, have a question mark in the minds of where he applies for the masters according to you guys from, from personal experience i can tell you that uh, f grades don't really matter that much if you overall meet the criteria I plenty i can show you my transcript i have lots of them uh three times just for calc one for finance i have a good solid six or seven right, lying around over there right um but look you have extenuating circumstances with adhd um i that's something they take very seriously in the uk it's something they do ask you in the application form i know there is special consideration and there's a lot of support so don't worry about it just do your best get as high of a gpa possible explain your circumstances and your personal statement i really do think um they'll give you a shot and even once you get here there's a lot of support there genuinely um in terms of just like mental health well being support from your tutors extenuating circumstances for deadlines um for covid um we we've all automatically gotten like a automatic one week extension if we want to take it for all our assignments we don't even need to give a justification right they do take care of you <laughs> i like daniel's expression as to how that will probably be happening in belkent very soon i presume but like, <laughs> don't worry seriously kubila you you uh don't need to worry at all things can definitely work out hopefully Uh, we have several other questions in the chat but before that uh, eda has uh, raised her hand for uh, since quite a while so eda you can unmute yourself and ask your question very helpful and my question is actually about cost of living and like as you know the turkish currency is not doing very well nowadays and i was wondering about the you know rents and accommodation food everything how is like cost of living there mm, i can answer for the netherlands um yeah i believe you also have to like you need to show that you are able to finance uh, you have enough finance uh before coming to the netherlands and yeah you need to show like proof of demo document um so in that yeah in that sense you also need to provide it's usually the amount of i believe nine months or maybe even one year and then per month it i believe it was around 800 uh yeah, on average because you for food and like daily expenses you spend around yeah on average 250 300 if you are going to cook yourself then maybe even 200 will be enough and then yeah there might be some other expenses if you're going to travel in the country then yeah it depends yeah 50 or 100 euros all oh, yeah depends how much you travel or Uh, yeah accommodation wise depends also where you are going to live you could find a place like a room for 300 350 euros or you could live in a studio for yeah 600 or 700 euros uh, sometimes in the netherlands if the studio is 1000 euros or yeah, above a certain limit you can also get a subsidy from the government if you are a student so you can get that subsidy until you graduate so yeah overall around I would say around eight hundred, nine hundred per month for the Netherlands. Mm. Okay, uh, for the UK, um, a first of all, varies where you go. In the UK, it's a significantly cheaper if you go to the north, like Manchester, Leeds, etc. London is one of the world's most expensive cities. Even for the visa, it has a higher criteria to show. Um, but for Edinburgh, I can tell you that it's like. Um, just for your normal sort of living expenses we could say 4 to 500 uh, a month uh, in pounds um this is not like a luxury budget this is just an okay budget where you're cooking yourself and all of that that's just for expenses um uni housing i think the the cheapest options start at 6 or 700 private flats the cheapest ones would be like around 400 but again this is what i mean by location the ones which are costing you around 400 you need to view them in person before saying yes let's put it that way uh, you could get into some really weird accommodation scenarios here if you're not careful so just look at that but um if nothing you should keep in mind like 1000 pounds in the uk a month if nothing you know like uh, th this is just like very basic kind of thing um in that sense and for london it's more this is for edinburgh for london put on another couple of hundred because it's definitely 15 20% more expensive than edinburgh which is already one of the more expensive cities thank you nosh also i find it hilarious that you're talking about cooking food yourself 
Oh, bro, I've been cooking a yeah, lot. Yeah, you cook pizza the other day, but never mind about that. Uh, we have a question from uh, Melissa Mazman. Uh, it's directed to both of you generally. Uh, did you go on Erasmus or university exchange programs during your undergraduate, which maybe helped you decide on the country to go for, for your master's? Do you think it's a good idea? Uh, I didn't do any uh, Erasmus or exchange during my four year bachelor, but uh, I like many of my friends who have done Erasmus are very motivated to continue with the, with the master's program directly after bachelor's. I know many people who did their Erasmus in the Netherlands and then they came for a master to the Netherlands because they like uh, uh, the education system, the country. So I would say if you have a chance and if you really want to go for Erasmus, you should definitely do it. So it's a very good idea. I just didn't do it myself for some reasons. I wanted to say at Bill Kent and so on. I feel you. Yeah, I didn't do an Erasmus either. Um, for <laughs> reasons being, I just felt comfortable here and my GPA was really low. So I didn't want to freeze it. I wanted to move it up and gradually it just kept moving up because the GPA usually is frozen when you want Erasmus, as I understand. Again, I haven't been, so not the best source, but um, it would be a great idea, honestly, if you could go, because like, if you want to go to the Netherlands to study and you go on Erasmus, of course, you live there for a few months, you get an understanding of some aspects of the culture, make some friends, it'll just make your transition easier. So if you could go, and it would look really nice on your CV and your thing. So if you could go, definitely uh, give it a shot. Um, but it's not necessary, definitely. Um, you can learn more about culture by just talking to people who study there. Bill Kent has a wide alumni everywhere. Um, I can tell you Scotland is a great place. Um, I actually have a friend from uni who's attending this session. Jack, you want to pitch in for a second about Edinburgh? Sure, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, well, hi, everyone. Um, Hello, Jack. Hi, I don't, can, you, can you see me? Yeah, Yeah, we can see you, man. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, my name is Jack. And uh, yes, as now said, I'm from Edinburgh and I'm currently studying the same course as him, Masters in Entrepreneurship and Innovation. I came along here mainly to see how Nash was doing. I'm interested in his talk and was hoping to distract him, but I failed to do that because it was a good talk. Um, and yeah, like I've already worked with Nash for a couple of months um, on the Masters course. I was in a few of his classes and his group projects. And certainly one of the things I noticed is just the sheer diversity that kind of being at a university uh, and a master's course gives you. And it also does really push you. But I do remember being in a lot of your positions where I was an undergraduate student wondering, should I do this or not? And my main advice is that if you've already had, you know, three or four years of studying, what's one more year going to do when it actually really, really puts you out there in the spotlight? Uh, it practically sets you up for a very strong career and gives you the kind of right framing to be able to go and do what you'd like. So it's challenging. There are a lot of things to figure out, but as now says, you can persevere. If it's possible, I would definitely recommend it. And I've had fun knowing now she's a very smart guy and kind of look forward to more future stuff. So I guess that's my take. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you, Jack. That's appreciated, man. You know, also, just to add to these uh, points, uh, we, well, this was the other way around, actually. We have a BIH member. I don't think she was able to join us today, but uh, uh, we had an exchange Erasmus student, uh, Veronica. She came from Slovenia to Bill Ken on Erasmus, and she liked, just liked so much that she, she decided to continue her master's in Bill Ken. So, you know, there are people who go on Erasmus and they do like the place for whatever reasons, and then they do decide to stay. So, I would, even I did not go on Erasmus, but if you have an opportunity, I would just go on Erasmus generally. And uh, Melissa, I hope that answers your question. The next question we have is from Taha Emre Altunda. Uh, I'm a freshman. I still don't know how to get in touch with instructors, especially during an online semester. Mentioning recommendation letters, what is the best way to have a stable communication with them? Not sure. Once you have experience with online course, maybe you can start. <laughs> Yeah, um, okay, so I was lucky enough to get in touch with my advisor when things had not fully shut down yet, so I did manage to correspond over email, but honestly, send emails. I presume professors are running online office hours in Bill Kent. I, is that the thing? Yeah, okay, good. So pop in to an online office hour because I went to, well, an in-person office hour, and I went very sheepishly with my uh, 2.9 and with a lot of Fs and 14 courses, and I expected my advisor to laugh me out of the room, right? I just thought she was going to say, May just focus on graduating first, work for a bit, just get yourself sorted, right? But she's like, no, you've done so much work. 
in terms of extracurriculars, your GPA is perfectly fine for that. Just try and push it above three and you got this. That's what I mean, that talking to your advisor helps a lot. Coincidentally, my advisor is in innovation management as well. So it's the same area. So it helped a lot in terms of deciding the uni and all. But just pop into office hours, send emails. You may not get a response from your advisor. You may not like what your advisor says, to, but keep getting in touch with people because you ultimately just need one or two people on your side. And you've studied with what, 20, 30 different professors throughout the uni at least. So odds are you find your people, but just you, you have to pop into office hours, have your CV ready, send emails, be proactive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Sorry. So we, please, please, please. Yeah, yeah, I don't have so much to add, but um, yeah, you you need to kind of keep the communication with your uh, with the person with the professor you are going to get the recommendation letter from uh, outside the class hours uh, as well, and you you need to know the professor very well. The professor needs to know you well as well, maybe not very well. Then it's also easier to yeah communicate and make this interaction. Right. Um... Even though I'm I'm a third year student right now, I, have, I did not even start applying for masters yet. But uh, I have recent experience with recommendations letter uh, recommendation letters, and I've had the same problem that I've had like zero communication with any of my teachers. Even though I'm in the third year right now, I've had like more uh, one and a uh, three semesters so far where there's been like in person classes, but I still don't know any teachers at all. But you know the difficult times the teachers understand this. And they're really helpful about this. I emailed four different teachers and I got a reply from them ASAP, like within a day or two, all of them were ready to write me a reference letter. Uh, even though two of them I hadn't even met in person or not even in like office hours, they just knew me through class. So they were really willing to do that. And they were even like willing to sit down, maybe talk about it, go over it and uh, just hear me out. So don't worry about this. You're still in your first year. I imagine, you know, uh, if things start going well, we're going to soon have physical classes again and you can uh, get to know your teachers. But even if that's not the case for another year, it, there's nothing to worry about. The, the professors here are really helpful, at least in the management and economics department. So I did I mention I got like a reply from four teachers, even though like I didn't know them that well. So th it's nothing to worry about uh, as of now. All right, then uh, I hope uh, that answers your question, Taha Henry. Uh, we have a next, another question from Bengi Su Solmaz. Uh, this is, I think, Director Sabuhi. Uh, is the scholarship that Sabuhi, re Sabuhi received special only for Tilburg University or do other universities in the Netherlands, like Groningen, Amsterdam, etc., also provide certain scholarships for non EU citizens as well? Uh, I'm not sure about the scholarships. Uh, in, like, yeah, in general, for Tilburg University, for example, there are some certain scholarships. Yes. Yeah, for example, if you're from BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, I believe. So then, yeah, there are some certain scholarships, but I didn't find, I couldn't find any scholarship for myself. Uh, about the reduction of the tuition fee, I got accepted for acceptance from Groningen University and Leiden University as well, but they both were 15,000 euros. So no reduction. Tilburg University does this due to successful collaboration with Bill Kent University. So to answer your question, uh, other universities do not, to my knowledge, do not uh, do reduction. All right. Um, we have, I think a last question. If somebody else wants to send in any other questions, now is the time because otherwise after this question, we're going to end the session. Okay, Shahan has a question. But Shana will take you after I read out the question. By the way, Noshirwan has sent the website for the loan website is called prodigyfinance.com. It's in the chat. You can scroll up and find it. We have a question from Iqbal Kareem. Uh, it's a general question. Approximately when should we be applying for masters? Like in which semester to be accurate? Like which year, which semester? Um, as soon as possible. Literally when, when, when the university deadline opens, make your list. Make your list as soon as you're thinking about masters and you're getting towards that short. You start lining up your list of universities when you have your list made uh look up the deadlines see if they're rolling if it's round based if it's just one deadline for all there's different ways universities do admissions the best rule is to apply as early as possible unless and the only exception i would say is that there's some reason for delaying which in my head the only reason that comes into mind is that if your gpa is low but you feel like you're going to get 
are really high GP in a particular semester and boosted up. So you want to wait and there's still time. Make sure there's still time for the grades to come out and you can apply. Otherwise, as soon as possible. Slots go away. Funding goes away. It's just better to get this lined up. Um, yeah. And uh, to add to that um, from my side, I, I, I already knew at the end of the third year in the summer, like in September, beginning of fourth year, which universities I want to apply to. I was not considering like the US or UK because I believe they have deadlines earlier, like in October or December. Most universities I was planning to apply had the deadline in January, March, April. So I knew that I need to, well, be ready to apply by yeah, December, the latest. I also took the IELTS exam in December. I had the recommendations that are ready by December. So around end December, early January, I was ready with all my documentations to apply. Okay, so basically uh, third year, first semester, you should like start seriously working on your master's application. Uh, yeah, talking to your professors for guidance uh, and getting recommendations, knowing which exams you need to pass. If you need to pass GRE exam, then better to do it during the summer or yeah, in a less busy period. Tilburg University does not require GRE. Uh, so I didn't, I just, I didn't prepare for it. All right. Uh, with that, we're going towards the last question of the day. Uh, Shahana has a question. He's raised his hand and then we will conclude this session officially. I, I actually, it's not last question. I have a bunch of questions, <laughs> but that's fine. I'll make it my last question. First of all, Noshirvan, so we thank you guys so much for taking the time out. Uh, me being in my sixth semester right now, all of this has been really helpful. I'm going to start applying in the summers now. And uh, of course, I have a shit ton of questions where I'm going to ask the more important ones. Um, this, the first one is for Subui. You know, since, as an international student uh, and coming to a country like Turkey where English is not the primary language, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, find jobs where you can do the front end work. Of course, programmers find jobs because they do back end jobs. But uh, I want to pursue like a career where it's sort of like, um, relationship management, just generally working with people. So I want to know what, what is the situation like in Turkey, because uh, in uh, Netherlands, sorry, because generally I think a lot of people speak English there, but how's the work environment? Like, do you require a certain level of Dutch or are they like open to taking internationals? What's the scene? Yeah. Um, if, if we exclude the English speaking countries like Australia, UK, US, the best English speaking country, like the nation in the world, are the Swedish and the Dutch. So the Netherlands, I, I would say 90 95% of people in the country speak English fluently, like in the market or in the streets, anywhere. You could always approach people in English. So in the job market, they would like to see some Dutch, but it's not required uh, at all. Uh, of course, depends on the company. Uh, I'm currently working as well. Uh, I got uh, an internship and then later a job as well. And I only speak Dutch and yeah, it's not required in my company because it's an environment and so on. Um, so I would say it's good if you can, if you have a chance, it will be nice to learn at least practical Dutch. Yeah. Just to, just to show it also that you are willing to live in this country further and contribute to the society. But if but you don't like Dutch at all, many of my friends, uh, they have got a job without speaking a single word of Dutch. Right. And for example, I, I'm considering like the banking sector. And for that, you know, you have, there's a lot of laws that you have to refer to. Even in like consultancy work, there's a lot of laws that, so is the official language Dutch or is all the paperwork in English? Because normally, like, that's one of the biggest problems in countries where they don't, the primary language isn't English. Yeah, it also depends. But most of the, if you're saying, referring to banking sector, most yeah. of them, they operate um, in English. But some of them have Perfect. only, like, ex exclusively Dutch-speaking environment. Perfect. Um, okay, Narsh, I'm going to ask you one question. Uh, regarding the loan, of course, um, you know, obviously, they scrutinize you when they're giving you a loan. So can you just walk us through the process uh, the, the process or the requirements? Like, do they ask you to put some kind of collateral? Do they check your bank statement, see if you have the money already? No, uh, that's the thing about Prodigy Finance. So Prodigy Finance, it's an, American, um, it's an American company, but it's like also very prominent in the UK and South Africa and a few countries, it's international. They do not take collateral. Um, hmm. 
they what they do basically is that when you apply that's why it's important to apply early they have like funds for each school so they have certain universities they support in the us in the uk and they have all the fields it's not just business but it's mostly american schools but in the uk they support a lot of business schools they support some business schools in netherlands as well so in business you get a bit more diversity but they have that list on their website so if you get into this university that's listed and their programs listed below that university acceptable programs you get into one of those you apply for the loan as long as the funds are still there for that uni you're going to get the loan guaranteed the only thing that varies is the interest rate so the interest rate on your loan will depend on if you've worked if you're earning a salary if you have a credit score and if it's good if you don't have a credit score like i obviously did not as a student so that is acceptable as well having a negative credit score is a problem or a bad one so if you have a good one or if you don't have one as a student either one is great but a good one of course decreases the interest rate work experience salary decreases the interest rate so that's what fluctuates on prodigy the interest rate on your loan hmm. um but they don't need a collateral they just need to see that you've gotten into the uni they just take some documents like an official thing of your credit score an official thing of um like a bank statement in the sense that what they might see is that for the uk they only submit uh, they only help for tuition not tuition and living so they take bank statements to see that you can afford living on yeah. your own um because they don't want to give you the loan and you can't afford to live and then the loan goes to waste and, you know so yeah. it depends like in the uk they only do tuition as i understand in the us they do tuition and living so there they wouldn't even need that so this that varies but it's mostly a game of interest rate uh, depending on the things you'll fill in on their website they have a preliminary thing um where they just give you a preliminary thing if you fill in basic details like this is your preliminary loan offer then you submit documents and you get the final loan offer so mm -hmm. that's how it works you can see the payment plan options in terms of time what you're going to pay per month and all of that so that's how it works basically perfect and and do you start paying as soon as you graduate or do they give you like a grace period no you have a grace period of 6 months 6 months so my first payment is not due until end of march uh 2022 basically okay. and once if you have hardship or something it's in the contract you can take a i think it was like a four or six month gap in between as well if for some reason you're switching jobs or you're going through some hardship you can take a pause once as well in between the payment makes plan. sense perfect that answers my question thank you so much nosh right. thank you so much abhi and thank you so much guys just generally as well for coming and doing this talk uh also like thank you to jack simmons uh, who joined us as well from uh, ashwan's friend and we also had uh, sabhi's friend also join in uh, uh someone uh, i think akshin akshin ashwan is my brother yeah uh, yeah your brother exactly and uh, also we had some like ex bih members as well we had the ex bih vice president zishan kapadia join as well we had jaran kaya join in so thank you to everyone who joined in all the participants it was a pleasure having all of you here also the bis members who are here right now uh one if you haven't sent in your names to sima for attendance please send them in right now for people who want ge 250 250 one points also send in your names and id to sima also noshirwan has sent in his linkedin profile shameless yeah. linkedin plug man is <laughs> part of the hustle sorry guys it's just so it is please what it is. uh go <laughs> connect with noshirwan and bih members if you want you can turn on your cameras we can have a small team picture with like two or just bih members. members i think generally cuz we have yeah, really everyone just yeah. i would request everyone who can to please turn on their cameras we're going to take a photo uh for the instagram it would mean a lot to us thank you um isn't the security guy coming to like close the room <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's the, we don't have that problem online okay we just get like this oh, yeah, you come up us and be like why is the event still going on <laughs> So we I did miss this. <laughs> but That's yes. Good. But thank you guys for having us honestly. It was yeah, brilliant. It was our pleasure. Uh it was amazing to see you guys again like genuinely. Uh, uh, we've not had much interaction with anyone in the past few months, year, uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but this was nice. Uh and really helpful actually as well. So uh, Shahana uh, take the picture i think everyone who wanted to turn their on their cameras has turned them on you know yeah, yeah, both is just turning their cameras on so uh, is anybody is much it perfect i just one more photo guys perfect jeez
perfect. Ashwan, do you still remember Akshay? <laughs> ah, yeah, of course, man. Of course. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Nosh. Thank you, Sabohi. This is all for today. Uh, we're going to post this on YouTube as well. Sabohi, you want to say something? Yeah, I didn't. I yeah, it's gonna take time for me to post my link for LinkedIn. But okay. if you message me on LinkedIn or Facebook, I'm always answering uh, and replying to your messages. So yes, you can always yes. reach out to me. He replied to my invite like within five minutes. You know, Nosh <laughs> took a day to reply. <laughs> Sabohi was like, "Yes, I'm in, bro." <laughs> Man, I was I was dying, man. Like Jack can verify, I was dying with the workload, man. We just had a presentation on in the morning. It's been a tough week and a half. It really has. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I've been here to support now. Sean is uh, on his journey, basically, and uh, yeah, I will testify that he has been dying. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that why you invited Jack Nosh so that like he can like testify on your behalf? That, yeah, yes, yeah, you know, because I was. <laughs> I was borderline not able to make the visuals. I was rushing through right before, you know, typical Bill Kent style, two seconds before the deadline, that kind of vibe. But I got them done. So like, just in case I don't have them, I'll have Jack to vouch for me. <laughs> all right, then I'm going to end the meeting. Uh, see you all good. hopefully very soon. We have more workshops planned as well. Uh, you will see it in the upcoming days. Stay tuned to our BI Instagram channel, our emails, our Facebook, basically our social media. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.